This is my history of Harley Davidson ownership through a lot of my life, both in joy and frustration. It didn't take but a few minutes of riding that Sportster is to understand why, you know, all people get obsessed with Harleys because there's something about it. They rumble, the, you know, that B-twin bellowing underneath you, how uneven the timing is because of the way it's designed with that common crank. It's just a unique engine design. It shouldn't even work for physics probably. But it does, and it, it's everything from that first start when you hear the starter motor chugging away and it takes off and fires, and once it's actually running, then you, you know, shift and you let out the clutch, and it's, it's almost like driving an old tractor. I mean, these things are like a two-wheeled version of farm machinery almost, just so crude and rudimentary in their design, but that's part of the appeal to it. I couldn't wait to get rid of the bike I had and find some kind of an option for a Harley. The next summer, I got a really good job working on a state-funded job for construction, and I actually had the money to go find something cheap, you know, that maybe needed a little work. I asked the neighbor, he had an old Sportster, he wasn't interested in selling, and so I found Kyle and asked him if he knew of any options, and he told me about a bike, and you could tell his eyes kind of went up into the stars and he said, oh, I remember my first bike, you know, and just reinforced I was on the right path. So he told me about one, Dad and I went over to look at the bike, that owner had basically come out of a bar, drunk, made it three blocks, hit a parked car, the bike fell over on his leg, broke his leg, another guy, a tank, if that gives you an indication of the size, happened to go over to try to get the guy's jacket out of the way and ended up stepping on the leg he just broke. So unfortunately for that guy, you know, years afterwards, he's still limping. Um, just And he started taking the bike apart and trying to redo it, but he was never going to finish it. That was the reality. It sat out in his garage. I can't remember if it was a dirt floor or not, but you know, he had the skeleton of a bike and these awful brown body parts that were kind of scattered around and there were, I don't know, three or four milk crates full of parts. It was a true basket case. So we looked at it. He told me he wanted, you know, four grand, 4,500, whatever for it. And dad and I went back home and we talked about it and he said, you know, that bike's gonna need a lot of work. And I said, I totally agree. A couple days later, we went back over there, picked up the bike, put all the crates of parts and everything into the trailer, to the back of the pickup. And we got it home and my mom and sisters came out to look at it and it did look awful. It was all dusty, cobwebs, just a skeleton there and it looked pretty discouraging. And dad said, well, it's not very pretty, but I wasn't seeing this ugly bike in ugly color and cobwebs. I was already picturing it bright red ripping down the blacktops. So once we get this pile of parts home, the next day I asked dad, I said, hey, is there anything I can do to start the process? And he said, yeah, go up to Royals, which was the local Harley shop, but it lost its franchise years earlier. The old guy that ran it just still had all these parts and bikes. Um, had a few old bikes in there, like an old WLA and an old Sportster and stuff. And he had a ton of inventory of old parts. So I went up there, bought the repair manual, which he had. As Dad had told me, I started taking the clutch apart to figure out why it didn't work. So I get home and I start reading the book and I start taking the clutch apart and trying to figure out what's wrong with it and stuff and get whatever parts I need. And, you know, over the next you know few days and whatever else it took to get parts on that, I finally had it back together and I had the primary case all sealed up and everything. And I was really proud that I'd done my first tax. Well, shortly after that, I'm sitting at coffee, I think, with dad and one of his buddies that had an old 65 shovel head uh, with a sidecar. And he said, yeah, do you remember that brass washer that went on the end of the starter shaft? You gotta have that or else it'll crack your outer primary. So I go home and sure enough, I found in the box this brass washer, looked in the manual, and somehow I missed the line about the brass washer because I was too eager to get it put together. So I had to tear the whole thing apart, put it back in. So it was a learning process, right? Like I'd never really worked on stuff like that before. So, you know, you eventually learn that with enough time and money and patience and the manual, you can figure out anything. You know, you might break a few things on the way, but that's part of how you learn. Through the next year with school and all that, dad did most of the work, honestly. 
Um, he ended up painting the parts. It was a 77 FLH, so Electrical Life Classic. And we ended up taking all the hard bags and the tour pack and the double buddy seat and all that ugly stuff, fairings, all that. I just threw it down in the basement. I had no intention of using it. Dad ended up painting it. I think it was a Ford red color. And it did look, it looked a little bit flat or dull in the, uh, in the dark. But once you get out in the sun, it was a very nice bright red. Coming back that next summer, we got it to where it was actually ready to fire for the first time. It had an SU carburetor on it, which is Skinner's Union. It's, uh, I think they used to put them on Jaguars, actually, or Jaguars. It's a CV carb, so you've got this piston going up on the cylinder. Well, during the wreck, that cylinder just bent in just a little bit, so it's touching on the piston inside, and it wasn't running smooth. So I took it apart, sanded it down, tried to make it smooth, just didn't work, so I ended up buying another cylinder piston assembly. Got that all set. We finally got it to fire for the first time, and Dad said, let him take it around the block first just to make sure everything's safe on it. It was amazing to hear that thing going down the road and hear him coming around the corner. Like, that was that was my first Harley. Now I had a Harley, and it was running. That was step one, and now I wanted to run it. However, I only had hernia surgery about a week before that, so I wasn't even supposed to drive a car for two weeks. About that next day or two, my buddies called and said, hey, we're going to Metallica at the state fairgrounds. Danzig's opening up for him. You need to come down. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Well, so even though I'm not supposed to even drive a car yet, that weekend I hopped on the Harley, threw a couple of clothes in the saddlebags. You know, I had these bolt-on leather bags, one full of tools and one with some clothes, and rode down to my buddy's place in Madrid, which is kind of my new one. On the way down there, the bike dies in Ames, won't start, so I had to push it. I still got my 13 staples in down here. I had to push the bike to a service station to get the battery charged up, then made it down to Madrid, and was checking my points and trying to do the basics of what I knew how to do to try to make sure the thing was running okay. Ended up going on to Erlen, where I met all the rest of the derelicts. We all carpooled to Des Moines, went to the Danzig and Metallica concert. I just couldn't go in the mosh pit. I just kind of stood in the back, making like a squirrel and protecting my nuts. And eventually, hopped on the bike from Earlham, driving home, two and a half, three hours, whatever ride it was. It was in the dark. I'd been drinking. I had a raccoon run out in front of me. At some point, I heard a noise, a clink, clink, clink down the road. And what that was is the big old blinker bar in the back of the, those FLHs, one of the little press nuts, whatever the hell they are, had come loose, it had drugged through the nice new paint, and then rattled off and went down into a ditch somewhere. So the first ride wasn't the most enjoyable. The other aspect of it is that I couldn't even turn it off at the gas pumps because the carburetor wasn't tuned right yet. It ran, but not well, and not over time. So I had to tune that. I got a book from Kyle, actually, on how to tune an SU carb, because that was not in the Harley manual. Got that set, and then it actually was tuned and running pretty decent. Now this bike had actually originally been owned by some guy who rode it to Sturgis and he dropped a valve down into it. So you've got original engine, first owner drops a valve, it's on its second engine. Dad and I rebuild it, so now it's on its third engine by the time that I even start riding that bike. At some point, I wanted to make it a little bit faster because it was pretty gutless, especially after driving Dad's Sportster, which went like hell, to that thing. It was a bigger, heavier bike. It was more comfortable. I loved the bike. But I thought, well, if there's something simple I could do to get a little bit more power out of it. So we bought a camshaft for it. It's a 77 FLH. We put new bearings in. We line ring them. We went to put the nose cone on over the cam. And it just didn't seem like it fit quite right. So, start reading the fine print. It had a groove on the front face. That groove means that even though it says 1977, it's a late 77 bike, which means it takes a 78 cam, not a 77. So, had to go get another cam, new bearings, new line ream, put, the, put it together. And at the end of the day, it really didn't make any difference on the bike as far as power. I couldn't tell any difference anyway. It was the biggest cam you could go without having to do, you know, head work. Other than that, I really didn't do a hell of a lot for upgrades. It was 
more with that bike, I was always trying to just keep it running, not trying to make it faster. But if you made it somewhere okay, something was probably going to break on you on the way home. That's, you know, it was usually just little stuff, but, you know, I had a lot of problems with that bike. So it's on engine three. At some point, it started developing some top end noise. I tried adjusting the push rods, making sure those were good. I put my finger up inside the hole on the underside of the heads to see if there was play in the rocker arms. A little bit, but I mean, I couldn't measure them from down there really effectively. So adjust everything, put it back together. Coming home from the bars at Clear Lake that night, it's about a 25 mile drive, 2 a.m. I'm blazing down Highway 18 and it, I could hear that noise and I thought, you know, if it's gonna break, it's gonna break. So I just pinned the throttle, let it go and it broke. And the back tire locked up. Fortunately, I had just enough coordination left to pull in the clutch quick so that I wouldn't slide into a ditch. Got it stopped and I was right by Duncan, which is a tiny, tiny town, but I have a cousin that lives there so I pushed the bike back up the hill to Duncan, put it out in his driveway, and went in and just laid on the floor. It was Iowa, Duncan, Iowa, doors are open, nobody cares. So I just laid on the floor, called mom and dad, and said, I'll be, you know, come get me in the morning. So the next morning, come around, dad came to with the truck, and then we put the bike in there. Well, I started taking it apart, and when I took the air cleaner off, there were pieces of the piston inside the intake man. Not a good sign. Took that off. Took the heads off. And you could see the top of both pistons, but the rear one was all beat to piss. And when I reached down, I realized that all I had left was the dome of the piston. Everything from the oil rings down was completely disintegrated and floating throughout the engine. So you had the aluminum in the intake. You had pieces of it down in the case. It was disastrous. It bent the rod, of course, too. Don't really know what went wrong, uh, if somehow a wrist had come loose or, or what had happened, but it was catastrophic. So whole engine comes apart. This time I had to take the bottom end apart too. I had a guy over in Mason, Newt, went and rebuilt the bottom end for me. And I think he redid the valves with the impregnated cast iron valve guides because, you know, at that time, fuel no longer has lead in it like it was in 77 when the bike was built. So get everything done, put it all back together, works again. Now it's on its fourth engine, right? There were other things along the way, the rear brake calipers, those old banana calipers, you know, they started egging out with that pin in there. And so there was a period where you'd hit the back brakes and it'd just lock up and you'd sit there and roach your pads for you. So if I used the back brakes, I'd have to stop, pull over, pry the pads open with a screwdriver. Uh, we eventually, put the bigger pins in and you know you gotta like line ring it out put a bigger pin in. After college brought the bike with me to Texas, rode it around down here up to Austin to the events, um, you know just around San Antonio and everything. Had a blast on it. It was a good time of life. You know first time out of college with a decent job, a few bucks to go blow at the bars. Had a great time on it. And there were, of course, events like riding to meet my buddies at the gym, showing up with oil all over the leg because uh, oil pump line burst, whatever else it may be. It's always something with that bike. At some point, I did end up replacing those awful banana calipers with a decent set of GMA brakes and then new uh, hand controls and stuff. One of the best upgrades I could have ever done for that bike. I wish I'd done it years earlier. Made such a different stop on that bike. But at some point, it started dying too and I was starting to get noise and it's like well you know I don't have as much tools here being kind of out on my own for the first time as what dad had in his shop so I took the engine out by this time I could get that whole engine out of a, a rideable bike in about three and a half hours so got it all out hauled it down to a shop lease power cycle that's now an Airbnb but hauled it down there they took the engine apart the cases were getting tired, they were chipped, they had to weld in and machine it out. And there's only so much you can do with those engines because the way the frames are built, you can't just go stick a, a nice big new 121 in there or anything. But all you can do is a, is a square 100 inch, maybe, if you can find one. But I hated to go away from 
factory as well. We did punch it up to uh, from uh, 1200 to 1340 or whatever, which I think is an 80 inch. I think the bike only had 60 horsepower to start with being an FLH. The FL had 55, I think. But it's never going to be a high performer. It's always going to be just a big old fat hog that's only going to go so fast. Which, honestly, for the time of my life, through college and those first years after, a big slow bike is probably perfect for me as opposed to the cross rocket or something. But it had been almost 10 years and it just became like a girlfriend that you bought diamonds for that fucks the neighbor. It was on its fifth engine with 25,000 miles or so and I'd given it everything I could. It just didn't play well and I think we were tired of each other. Shortly after that engine build, then the transmission started sounding bad. You could tell, lifted it up and put, put the screwdriver in my ear to the transmission. It was coming from there. So I took it to a local shop here in town and asked them if they could swap out the gears. The owner really didn't give me a warm fuzzy that he knew what the hell he was talking about mechanically, which made me a little bit nervous, but I was traveling so much for work. I didn't have time to do it myself. I needed to get the thing back on the road. So they went in, they replaced all the gears, and then about a week or two after I had it, I was driving home from work, and it suddenly would not shift the auto fourth gear. That shifter gear had broken it, so I took it back to them, and they replaced the shifter gear with some Chinese knockoff, and they almost dumped it because of the way it locked up. So then they tell me, well, we can't find anything except these cheap Chinese knockoff ones you drive. I found one in some store in Texas, a Harley store, shipped it over to them, said, there, now you got the right part, get it done. So they finally got it done, and then they came back to me. The spotlight was rotated 90 degrees. They didn't even take the time to straighten that after whatever they did. The starter solenoid was actually shorting against the bracket. They stripped out the thread on the rear exhaust stud, and it also was leaking oil on the transmission seal over on the primers. When I finally had it back, and it was finally running, and I had fixed all their fuck ups, and it was still leaking at the tram. So I went back over to the shop, super pissed off. It was in between cars, so that was my only vehicle, and I had to get a rental car for a couple of weeks. There's a little dude in front of me, and he says, you here for Dennis? I said, yes sir. And uh, he pulls up his shirt, and he's got the butt of a pistol sticking out of his pocket, and he goes, well, I get him first, you can have what's done. And I pulled up my shirt to show him. I had the Glock right there, too. The guy had no business having anything to do with motorcycle repair. Uh, probably ended up floating in the Rio Grande based on some of his business practices. Finally got the bike all together. It's running, but it's time to separate. Fifth engine in 25,000 miles or so, whatever it was. I loved it, I had great times with it, but it was time for a change. And that's when I started building my first chopper. I'll soon be posting a video on all the choppers that I built. Well, I had my shop by Chrome Customs in Florida as well, and that link will be in the description of the video below. So until then, keep the shiny side up. Subscribe to my YouTube channel below and let's celebrate turning fuel and air into adrenaline.